let's show you the first uh, tree. This is the mangrove tree. Anything uh, peculiar about it that you notice? Kind of different, eh? Yeah, the mangrove tree is, um, has roots that are called aerial roots because they grow in areas where there is little to no oxygen in the water. Trees like this with aerial roots are called pneumatophorus, which means that they are reaching for breath. The roots have pores on them called lacentals, uh, uh, so rather lenticels, which pull oxygen from the atmosphere. So instead of finding oxygen in clean or pure water, um, they grow in brackish or salt water. And so they have to, the root systems have to reach for breath. When I began to study about the trees after someone had brought the prophetic word and picture about these trees um, at the round table that we had, um, the more I could see, wow, that the name of the tree or the species and type of tree, I love that. Numa to forest because they are reaching for breath. And I felt like, you know, how much of our lives do that? We have these roots that go down deep, these roots that spread all throughout the ground and the dirt, but then there are other times where it seems that a part of our root system is growing above ground, a bit exposed. And, you know, this looks beautiful, but there are times when those roots get, they look like underbrush. They start to be overgrown, and there's so much of the tree that's looking for stability, and it's breathing for air or gasping for air, but doesn't have a super deep root system. Let me show you another tree. You may have seen one of these. And while that tree is coming up, this is an oak tree. Let me just read you a scripture. In the Passion Translation, Isaiah 61, you're familiar with this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is Jesus talking. But let me read it in the Passion Translation. The mighty spirit of Lord Yahweh is wrapped around men because Yahweh has anointed me as a messenger to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the wounds of the brokenhearted, to tell captives you are free, and to tell prisoners be free from your darkness. I am sent to announce a new season of Yahweh's grace and a time of God's recompense on his enemies, to comfort all who are in sorrow, to strengthen those crushed by despair who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful banquet in the place of ashes, the oil of bliss instead of tears. And the mantle of joyous praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. Because of this, they will be known as mighty oaks of righteousness, planted by Yahweh as a living display of his glory. Now think about these roots. They're below the surface, things that you can't see in a person's life. The hiddenness that you all have. You all have a hidden life in God that nobody can see. You all have roots on the outside that we can see. You all have fruit on the outside that we can see, but you all have a hiddenness in the Lord that has got a story to it. It's got an amazing background. It's got a history of believing God. It's got a history of trusting the Lord and growing in faith. How many of you know that your faith is not grown by your ability? In the kingdom, it's quite the opposite. Faith is grown by your surrender. But you've got a history with the Lord and deep roots. And there's to every tree and every plant even, there's a taproot that goes down. And it's the taproot that grows directly downward. It's the main root off of which all of the other 
roots grow. But that's your main root. And it is searching for strength. Its job is to strengthen the entire tree or plant and to look for water, nutrients, oxygen, all of that. It's the main root. And to be rooted and grounded in love is who we're called to be, the deep roots of who we are beyond what people can see. It's good to have fruit that manifests, but, and it's also good to have a hidden life in Christ. I feel like the Lord's saying right now that as trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, there's all kinds of fruit that is growing up in our lives, and a lot of it we can't see. Other people can see it. They come and pick from our fruit all the time in conversations. You're encouraging people. You're blessing people in notes, in texts, in all kinds of things. There's all kinds of ways that people are picking from our fruit. They're eating the fruit of our lives, of our tree, so to speak. Acts 2 verse 14 starts and says this, but Peter, taking his stand with the other 11, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea, and all you who live in Jerusalem, know this and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you assume, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what has been spoken through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Everybody say, on all mankind. On is different than in, right? I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. So it's fascinating to me because um, the upper room was a pivotal moment in church history. It was the moment when the Holy Spirit was poured out, the church was birthed, and God went from being just upon man to being able to be in man. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes and he's changing things. People began to manifest his spirit in different ways from that time on. And God was doing something by his spirit that only his spirit could do. God splashes in. He doesn't say, hey, if you go wait in the upper room, uh, first I'm going to start with a wind. Yeah, that would be good. Sound of a rushing mighty wind. Let's just start with that. That's always good. And then uh, you're going to pray in other tongues. Yeah, that, that, that's what we'll do next. Uh, fire. Fire. Yeah, I want fire over their heads. That's what we'll do. Let, let's have some fire. Uh, he didn't lay it out like that for his people. He just said, go wait, and you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. There's been all kinds of arguments about, hey, uh, so if, if, if I get baptized in the Holy Spirit, do I speak in tongues? And some people argue that if you don't speak in tongues, then you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's just as many times in the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit fell and they prophesied with no tongues. So it's just as uh, apropos to believe that you could um, prophesy and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, what if I prophesy and don't speak in tongues? Am I still filled with the Holy Spirit? Listen, all of those doctrines of men lead to confusion. Here's what Jesus said that you can take to the bank. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. We should be walking around with power. Whether, whether uh, or rather than wondering or arguing about the gift of tongues. Who's got power? Most of the people arguing about the gift of tongues don't have any power. We forgot that part. 